Take your Bible this evening, if you would, and go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something just a little bit different than what, we've, what I've ever done. Because uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to forget it. Um, back when uh, Philemon and his family joined the church, Elena was not here. And uh, so Elena didn't join when the family joined. And Elena wants to be a member of the church. Elena, wave at us back there. You see, there's Elena. Most of you know Elena. And uh, she's saved. She's scripturally baptized. And she would like to become a member of the church. And so whether, if I wait to the end, I'll probably forget again and not, not remember it. So we don't always have the invitation on Wednesday night. And so uh, can we take just a moment? And all those in favor of welcoming Elena into the membership of our church, let it be known by a hearty aye. And opposed, like sign. Okay. Congratulations. You're now a member. I know. Can you interpreting this for me, Philemon? Tell her she's now a member of Bible Baptist Church, okay? Amen. All right, see? Bueno. All right, very good. All right. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse number 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of the scripture, and Lord, I pray that once again as we open up your word and Study it together this evening that you will minister to our hearts. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Uh, bring the truths of God uh, into our heart. Make the changes that are necessary in our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would endeavor to not only rescue the perishing, but to rescue the fallen as well. Lord, there's people who are vessels in the house of God but they are broken vessels. And Lord, we want to recover them and put them back into use for your honor and glory. And so Lord, help us to know how to minister to them and how to effectively help a fallen Christian brother. And so Lord, speak to us through your word this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Now, we're going to review from last week a little bit. Remember, we didn't get all the way through last week. And so we, we talked about how if we're going to uh, rescue the vessels and make them vessels from dishonor to vessels of honor, then we have to remember we said we have to realize we are servants. We are servants. Okay? And uh, then we said, secondly, we have to realize we must not argue. We must not strive. Servant of the Lord must not strive. You're not going to help anybody by arguing with them okay and uh don't don't not only in not only in words but in actions as well don't get frustrated don't get get angry and uh get frustrated because they're not responding and to do that we said we must employ the fruit of the spirit gentleness we must we must not strive but be gentle unto all men that's not natural that's supernatural uh, gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. All right. Then it says, be gentle unto all men. Notice the phrase, apt to teach. And that's where we left off last week. That's where we'll pick it up tonight. We must be ready to teach. One of the great heroes of American education is a fellow named Noah Webster. Uh, if you're familiar with the famous 1828 dictionary, uh, he used the Bible as his foundation for definitions. He understood the power of words and the need for having precision in our words in order to communicate what we ought to communicate. He, he, had, a, he, had, a, he had the right philosophy of education. Webster wrote this, In my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. 
Well, that's such a far cry from leaders today, isn't it? And he, he said, truly, education is useless without the Bible. That was Noah Webster. He understood the value of being a good teacher. And so we understand that not only does this verse say that we ought to be able to teach, but it says, it, it says we ought to be apt to teach. The, the value of a good and godly teacher cannot be overstated. It can't be overvalued to have someone teach you the Word of God. And so uh, we, and by the way, we all are supposed to become expert communicators of God's Word. We're to able to admonish one another, able to teach one another, apt to teach. So we're to be communicating God's Word because we're communicating the truth to the captives who are taken captive by Satan that they can recover themselves from the snare of Satan. It's not that... Uh, listen... He's not just talking to Timothy here. He's talking to us. He's talking to every single believer and what we're going to need to do if we're going to deliver the captives. So we want to, by what we teach, by what we tell them from the Word of God, it creates a desire in them to say, I want that. Uh, last night in, our, uh, in the Bible class on Tuesday night, I got to fill in for Brother Moreland and... Um, in the personal evangelism, uh, people had to kind of write out their testimony. And uh, one thing stuck out in Mrs. Anderson's testimony. She said, you know, she, she had thought she was saved, but when she came to church and she said, and I saw people, and I saw how they behaved and how they spoke and what they, she said, I realized I don't have that. And she went to the pastor and his wife and said, I don't have what these people have and I want it. See, that's what you want to do in people. Create in them a thirst to say, whatever you have isn't what I have, and I want it. I want that. And the Spirit of God will do that as you teach them the Word of God. It's the Word of God that does that. So we're apt to teach. Everybody's a teacher. Everybody is to be a teacher, to convey the truth of the Word of God to others. Now, let me give you several things underneath this. The first thing is, the understanding and the ability to teach comes from God. The understanding and the ability to teach comes from God. <clears throat> Look up a little earlier in chapter 2 and verse 7. Remember what, what, Timothy, what, what Paul wrote to Timothy there? He said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee what? Understanding in all things. You understand Paul, I think, was a very effective teacher, a very effective communicator of God's Word. And uh, despite all that ability and skill that Paul had, he didn't rely on that to communicate the Word of God. He told the church at Corinth, I didn't come to you with the enticing words of man's wisdom. And he could have. Paul spoke when he told the church at Corinth, when they were all... Uh, speaking in languages and thinking they were super spiritual. Paul said, I can speak in tongues more than y'all. And he, he's not talking about unknown gibberish there. He's saying uh, they believe Paul could speak at least five languages fluently. And so he says, I could come here and speak some language and you wouldn't have any idea what I'm saying. He said, I, I have that ability and Paul was very well educated, but he wasn't relying on his education to make him an effective teacher. He was relying on the Holy Spirit of God. Relying on God to give him the understanding. He's, we, we, whenever you teach the Word of God, and it's not just for the pastor, it's not just for the missionary, it's not just for the evangelist, but whenever you're sharing God's Word with anyone, you must have the help of the Holy Spirit. And, and otherwise, it, you don't have any more, we don't have any more help with us than the door-to-door -door salesman would. Than the one who's peddling you know, uh, soap or uh, papers or anything else. Uh, the, the, it, we're we're going to have, we just have whatever the flesh can do. We're not out to just use slick sales gimmicks. We're out to have the Spirit of God work in people's hearts. And He does that as we use the Word of God. All right? Now, you, you think about 
how difficult a task Timothy would think about as he thinks about opening up the Word of God, opening up the, the truths of God, and, and standing before a group of people like we would have in the room tonight. Uh, differing ages, differing, differing personalities, differing levels of understanding, different levels of where you are spiritually and in your spiritual maturity, and be able to communicate God's Word for everyone to understand and everyone to receive something from God. Now, apart from the Holy Spirit of God, that's impossible. It can't be done. And so you have to have the, the, the help of the Holy Spirit. And He gives us that understanding and gives us that uh, ability to do that. The great news is when you teach others God's Word, you don't do it by yourself. Okay? I don't know if we stress that. Boy, when you go to study God's Word, when you go to read it and you get up in the morning, pause before you start and ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. He wrote the book. He lives in you. So ask Him to open your understanding. All right? And, and may the Spirit of God, that's why oftentimes we, we ask the Spirit of God to apply the Word of God to our heart today. He takes the message in. That's why sometimes, you know, it's interesting, and I know that uh, uh, Brother Sage has had this experience, I'm sure, Brother Yoder has, anybody who's taught or preached to people, you know, sometimes people come up and say, boy, I remember uh, you were preaching on this and you said this. I don't ever remember saying that. And I don't think I did say it. But you know who did say it to them? The Spirit of God said it to them. That's what the message they received. And God gave them that message that day. But that's a, how, many, how many times you've heard people give a testimony about being in church and the night they got saved. And some of them would tell you, I'm not even sure who the preacher was. I'm not even sure what he preached about. But I know an invitation was given. Boy, I came. I was the first one forward to fall on my knees and ask Christ to be my Savior. See? Because it's not, it's not the messenger. It's not the, the man. It's not the woman. It is God's Word and the Spirit of God that brings the conviction to people. All right? So we, we rely, and that ability to teach, that understanding comes from God. Number two, or B there, life transformation comes from God's Word. Life transformation comes from God's Word. We talked earlier from 2 Timothy 2.9 how the Word of God is not bound. Paul said, I'm bound. I'm in prison. I can't go out and spread the Gospel anymore. I can't go out and freely teach and preach, but the Word of God is not bound. That's why he would tell Timothy when we get to chapter 4, Timothy, preach the Word. And be instant in season and out of season. Because as you preach the Word, you realize the Word of God is never bound. The Word of God continues to work. And we have a, the Bible says there in 2 Timothy 4, there'll come a day when, when people will, will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is sound Bible teaching and preaching. They won't endure that. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, Scratch me where it itches. Tell me what I want to hear. Okay? And so they want to come and they'll heap to themselves teachers who will tell them, uh, I'm okay. Uh, you can feel okay about yourself. Everything's going to be all right. God's a loving God. He's not going to send anyone to hell. You're okay. Your, your best life is right now. I got news for you. My best life's still to come. Uh, I'm enjoying being a Christian. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. But this isn't anything compared to heaven. Paul said, I don't think the sufferings of this present time are worthy to be compared to the glory that we'll enjoy one day in heaven. So, uh, it's, it, it, but that's what people are looking for uh, in this day and age, and so many are. But, but the only, listen, the only message that's going to help somebody recover themselves from the snare of Satan is the teaching, the preaching of the Word of God. It's the Bible that's going to deliver them. It's the Word of God. Timothy was no newcomer to the Scripture. He tells Timothy in chapter 3 that from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. You were brought up. Remember, he had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. And they taught him the Scriptures. 
So he says, well, that's all I've ever known. I've just grown up with the Bible. Well, praise the Lord. There, there are many people in this room who didn't grow up that way and they would almost give their right arm to have grown up the way you grew up. And to say, man, I, what an honor, what a privilege to have known the Scriptures from a child and had it in your heart all the way and listening. Well, then, you know, listen, look what God did with Timothy. Timothy was a tremendous man of God and, and it's God's Word that transforms lives. Let God's Word do its work. It's the only book that will transform your life. It's the only book that will change your life. You won't continue to read the Bible and continue to study the Bible and continue to memorize God's Word without it changing you. It will change you. I tell people when they get saved, new converts, I think the best thing you can do for your Christian life is to be back in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You get, a, you get with God's program, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You know what happens? You begin to grow. You begin to get an appetite for God's Word. And then you begin to read God's Word on the Monday and the Tuesday and the Wednesday and the Thursday in between. And you'll find out that all of a sudden you're growing. You're growing spiritually. And changes begin to take place. And all of a sudden, I think in those testimonies last night, I think it was Lisa was saying that, you know, when she got saved, all of a sudden, you know what? Those other things she used to have a desire for, she didn't have any desire for that anymore. Watching a television program she used to enjoy watching, and says, man, what am I watching this for? Man, turn that off. I don't want to listen to that. You see, what happened? The Lord's changing it. The Word of God is changing you. And it changes your desires. It changes, it transforms you. It makes you into a new creature in Christ Jesus, all right? So, let's go to number C. Apt to teach, effective teaching requires endurance. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 uh, that you endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You remember the, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 23 through 28. You want to look there real quick and uh, keep your finger in 2 Timothy 2. 2 Corinthians 11. This is where Paul, by his own admission, says, I'm speaking as a fool. But he's uh, laying out. He opens up a little bit to us here so we get to know a little bit about his life. A little bit about his ministry that he's had. Alright? And in 2, Timothy, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse number 23, he says, Are they ministers of Christ? Here it is, I speak as a fool, I am more. Here it is, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Yet Paul penned half the New Testament. Paul is undoubtedly probably one of the most well-known believers that we would know of. Outside of the Lord Jesus, maybe one of the greatest Christians that ever walked the earth. Why was he effective? I think one of the reasons he was effective was he wouldn't quit. I mean, how many, how many of us would have went through that list and kept on going? He never quit. We, we have a whole lot less than that go on, and we're ready to throw in the towel. Say, oh, it's too hard. Oh, I had a bad week. Oh, it's been rough. Huh? When, 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 when we say that, we ought to turn to 2 Corinthians 11 and read those few verses and think, did I really have a rough week? I had a bed of roses compared to what Paul's been through. A bed of roses compared to what some of these, these men went through as they served God. 
We don't have it tough at all. Not at all. So we have to endure. You, first time, what's that mean when we're trying to help somebody? What's it mean when you're trying to rescue someone from the snare of the devil? It means the first time they don't do what you've asked them to do, the first time they go against what you've told them to do, you don't say, that's it, I'm done with them. No more of them, I, I, I'm not taking that. They didn't listen to me. You know, that's their bed, let them lay in it. No, 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 no. That says, you have to endure. You have to continue to endure. You can't quit. You can't give up. First time, if you just throw in the towel the first time you run into an obstacle or the first time the person doesn't do what you say, you'll never be an effective teacher. You'll never rescue anybody out of the snare of the devil. You understand, we understand, and by the way, if you've ever been in that situation, if you've ever been away from God, and you've had somebody try to tell you the truth, most in most cases, you know what? You didn't like it. We, you don't like people telling you the truth. But you know what you do? You tell them the truth anyway. You just tell them God's Word. And, and, you know, when they come back with, oh, you're judging me, just say, you know what? I'm just telling you the truth from God's Word. That's all I'm doing. Just telling you the truth from God's Word because I love you. That's all. And you don't quit. Okay? It requires endurance. D, faithful teaching. Faithful teaching will bring a reward. Faithful teaching will bring a reward. What's the reward? They can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Hey, it's a great thing when that happens. It's a great thing to see that take place. The reward of those who are apt to teach. We're God's servants. We belong to Him. We're, we're doing what God has asked us to do. We're, 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 and, and God's business is the most important business in all the world. And we ought to be about His business. And so we're, we're, we've been entrusted with the truth of God's Word so we can teach people who have been ensnared by Satan, deceived by Him, and now they're trapped. And we want them to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now, not everybody's committed to that. I understand that. How many times we hear about someone who's fallen away or who's backslidden, who's not been in church, and... We say, maybe we ought to, you know, if you talk to that person, if you gone to that person, if you make contact with them, you know what most Christians say? Well, I don't know what I'll say. Well, I don't know what I'd say. Well, you, t- you, you say the Bible. You give them some Scripture. Tell them that they're loved and that they're missed. See, you begin to minister to them and let them know you care about them. It's, a, it's got to be on the priority list for every believer. We can't, we can't just, you know, what, what for years fundamental Baptists have been real good at is getting new people saved and getting new people in the church while we're having other people go out the other, the other door. And it's just a constant rollover of people. And because we don't, when someone's gone, we don't try to help them. And recover them out of the snare of Satan. And, and we have to do that. To do that, you have to be apt to teach. Most of you know, Char- or know of Charles Schultz, who was the guy who wrote the comic strip Peanuts. And there's an article written, uh, and in that article, uh, he gave his philosophy of, of life. And he used a creative method to demonstrate how important it is that we genuinely care for people. Get involved in their lives. Whenever he spoke to a crowd, he'd ask ask these six questions. You ready? Can you name the five wealthiest people in the world? Can you name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? That's, That's an award given to the top college football player every year. Can you name the last five ladies who were crowned Miss America? 
Can you name five individuals who have won the Nobel Peace Prize? Can you name five Academy Award winners for the Best Actor or Best Actress? And then number six, can you name the last decade's worth of World Series champions? Then he'd ask the crowd, how'd you do in answering the questions? And of course, the inability to recall the names of those people reveals how quickly the headlines fade. How quickly the, the, what, what seemed to be so important isn't even remembered. He said, I didn't ask about the runners-up or the second-place finishers. I asked about the winners. Even the best in their field find that applause dies away, the awards tarnish, the achievements are forgotten, the accolades and certificates mold and gather dust. Then he said, let me ask you a second set of questions. Are you ready? Name a teacher who aided you on your journey through education. Name three friends who helped you through a difficult time in your life. Name five people who've taught you something worthwhile. Name five people who've made you feel appreciated and special. Name five people who you enjoy spending time with. People found those questions a whole lot easier to answer. So did you, didn't you? Here's the lesson Schultz wanted to, said he wanted to get across. The people that make the most difference in our lives are not the ones with the most credentials, or the most money, or the most awards, but the people who make the difference in our lives are the ones that care. They make the difference. So we talked about Sunday. When this Sunday comes, people aren't going to remember the meal. They'll remember who cared about them. They'll remember who wanted to sit down with them. Who wanted to talk to them. When normally no one wants to talk to them. Pick out the person who you think no one would want to talk to. Maybe no one would want to be with. And say, I'm going to, I'm going to care about them. And show them you care. They're the ones who care. They, the, the ones ensnared by Satan, they just need to know somebody cares. Somebody cares about them. And so he tells them, we have to care. We have to be apt to teach. But something follows that. Notice, he says we have to be not strive, be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. And then what's the next word? Patient. Oh, did he have to put that there? Patience. We must exercise patience. Now, there may be somebody to whom patience comes very easily. I've never met them. But I'm sure there's somebody like that out there in the world. But most of us, patience is not something we're, we like. Nobody, you don't, you don't go out to dinner on a Sunday or another night of the week and there's a line out the door of the restaurant and you say, well now there's a long line, let's go here. <laughs> I'm sure it's an hour wait, let's, get, let's go to that restaurant. Nobody does that. You say, no, we're not going in there, man, we're going to wait forever. Right? I was frustrated tonight as the, as the Lord would have it, you know, I... Uh, I'm about a seven-minute drive, six to seven-minute drive from my house to church, depending on the traffic. And tonight on the freeway, I left my house at 5.30, so I should have been here easily, even at, even at that time, by 20 to 6. And at 10 minutes to 6, I'm still sitting on the ramp over here. The traffic was backed all the way up the, the, the right lane of the freeway, getting off in Grove City. And, and I was just rejoicing that I could exercise patience. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I, uh, that's not true. I tell you, but what you need 
What we all need when we're dealing with people ensnared by Satan is we must exercise patience. Patience. No, none of us like to wait, but we have to be able to have patience and to wait. To fully understand, I'm going to help us understand what patience means from the Bible. All right? Uh, what, what exactly does God mean when He says we're supposed to be patient? There's several different words the Bible uses that carry the idea of patience. And I'm going to, have to look at a few of those tonight in our closing time here, okay? Let's go to Psalm 37 for our first one, okay? Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse number 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. The idea here is do not get ahead of God. Do not get ahead of God. You ever have that temptation? Probably if you've been saved any length of time, you would have to testify there's times I got impatient and I just said, okay, I'm going to do something. Waited on God. I've waited. I've waited long enough. I'm going to do something. We've got to do something. And we just went ahead and got ahead of God. Okay? And we took matters into our own hands and we launched out on our own. The, 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 the root word there for that patience, I want you to look over in Judges 21. Go back to your left again. After Deuteronomy, then Joshua, then the book of Judges. Judges 21. Okay? Interesting story here. Kind of a strange story, but it's, it's, it's here. Now you remember one of the... By the way, the key... The key verse to the whole book of Judges is the last verse of the book. Okay? In verse 25 of Judges 21, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what? What do you have? Three people there? Are you there? Judges 21, 25? In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that? Right in his own eyes. Everybody's just doing their own thing. Okay? And that really sums up the book of Judges. Now how far can that go? Well, look, look in verse, back to verse number 20. Therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards, and see, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance and dances, then come ye up out of the vineyards, and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. Here's what, here's what they're, they're saying. The men of Benjamin don't have wives. And so, they were told, here's what you do, you go down to Shiloh, when the unmarried women come out to dance their dances, you jump out of the bushes, take one, throw her over your shoulder, and take her home, she's your wife. <laughs> now, God's not recommending that's the plan, okay? That's not one that He says, that's how you ought to get a wife, okay? It just happened that way, and He recorded it for us in the Bible, okay? But, the, notice, Notice what it says here though. Verse 20. When he said, told the children of Benjamin saying, go and lie in wait. That's the same word there as in Psalm 37, patiently. Lying in wait. Not getting a, ahead of yourself. You, you, think, you, you think that that's where, where the word is. Now, now look at this though. Here's the thing. That's what you think it is. That's what I, I, I'm having in my notes here. I forgot to, to say that. Now, notice what it says, though. What's amazing to me is, and see and behold, if the daughter of Shiloh come out to dance in dances. Do you know what the word dance there? That's the same word as patiently. And it's not, wait a minute. Preacher, you telling me to dance? Now, wait a minute. Before you leave the church and say, pastor's going crazy. 
Dancing in the Bible is not the dancing that you and I talk about. Jumping up and down, leaping for joy. It's kind of like when the football team scores the winning touchdown with three seconds to go in the game and you start jumping up and down and screaming and hollering. That was the dancing in the Bible. Leaping for joy. Jumping up and down. And, and so, the same... Say, well, how can I wait patiently and leap up and down and dance for joy? Because the idea of patience is I keep on moving even when I don't see any progress. I keep on moving even when I don't see any progress. See, most of us think patience means inactivity. Not doing anything. But that's not Bible patience. God's not calling us to inactivity. He's saying, I'm telling you to keep doing the things you know you're supposed to do and the things you ought to do. Keep active and keep busy even though it seems to you you're just going in circles and you're not making any progress. We go through this with the are you program at times. I say, I don't think I'm getting anywhere. I don't think it's doing me any good. I think I'll just throw in the towel. Hmm? You know what? Patient. You need to continue to do what is right to do even if you don't see the progress. Because it's right to do. That's patience. Patience with someone who's been in the snare of Satan. I don't see any progress. They're not getting what I'm telling them. They don't even get to church faithfully. What am I? I, I don't know. I, I'm, they're not making any progress. We're tempted to quit. And God says, no, you have to have patience. You have to continue to do what you're supposed to do whether you're seeing visible progress or not. Patience. Keep trying to help. Keep trying to reach out. Keep speaking the truth in love. See, patient doesn't mean just sit back and coast. Okay? Keep doing what we're supposed to be doing. Even though there's hurts, even though there's frustrations, even though there's setbacks, we, we don't judge by appearance whether anything's happening or not. What are we doing? We're trusting God that He will bring about the harvest. You never know what God is doing inside of somebody. You never know what God is doing. But I believe God is working. And we want to be patient for God to work. I don't want to get ahead of God. How many times have we been impatient for a new Christian to come along, a new Christian to learn and to grow and to make changes, and we bombard them with a change. We, we bombard them with, what are you wearing that for? What are you doing that for? What are you talking? And we become, you make the change right now because I said so. Instead of patiently waiting on God to reveal that to us. I don't want anybody to change because I said so. I want to change because God told them so. God's, God's the reason behind it. And let God bring conviction to their heart. So it means don't get ahead of God. The second time that patience is talked about, and another word for patience, uh, there's two places I want you to look at. Uh, the first one would be Genesis 1. That should be easy to find. The second one is Psalm 40. The 40th Psalm. David says in Psalm 40 and verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. Now, that patiently is a different word than what was in Psalm 37. It is, though, the same word that's used in Genesis 1 and verse number 9. Where he says in Genesis 1.9, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. 
and it was so. That, that little phrase, gathered together into one place, is that same word for patience. It means to hold it together. Hold it together. Do you ever notice how impatience messes with our minds? You ever, you ever get so frustrated with somebody that it kind of tears you apart? And it ends up messing you up too? I've seen it happen. People get so frustrated over a situation or someone else that they come apart themselves. They lose it mentally or emotionally or financially or in whatever way they, they, it, it affects them. Maybe a family member, they live with a family member that has a serious problem and they're doing their best to rescue that loved one out of the snare of Satan, the snare of the enemy, but as time passes, rather than remaining patient, they start to crumble. They get frustrated. They sometimes stop coming to church themselves and they stop reading the Bible themselves and they don't pray like they should themselves. And everything begins to fall apart. Lifeguards are always very aware of one important thing, that they too could be pulled under and drowned trying to rescue somebody else. They're very aware of that danger being pulled under themselves. And the devil is a, is a roaring lion. He'd like nothing better than while you're trying to help somebody else, when you're trying to rescue someone else, he could pull you under as well. And he can do that. So be in your guard. Be patient. Hold it together. Okay? The third one is interesting. It's Ecclesiastes 7. Ecclesiastes, if you go to Psalms, Proverbs, and then right after Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. And it's chapter 7. And then if you'll pick up Ezekiel 17. Ezekiel chapter 17. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 8, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Patient in spirit. Okay? The word for patience there is different than the other two words that were used for patience. In, in Ezekiel 17, we see this word used again. Verse 3, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. That word long-winged is the same word as patient in the psalm. Now, what does long wing have to do with patience? Eagles have a wingspan that can reach up to nine feet. Those huge wings are what allow the eagle to take off what seemingly looks like it's effortless. The length of their wings allows them to catch even the smallest updraft of air. It's a beautiful picture of how patience works. If we have patience, listen, even the smallest indications of hope and progress will, will lift us to keep going in the right direction. That's patience. An eagle's wings don't get discouraged because there's not a lot of air moving. You know why? Because just a little bit keeps them going. The eagle doesn't you know what the eagle never do? The eagle never frantically flaps its wings. Doesn't do that. Each beat of the powerful wings takes the eagle a long way through the airs, through the air. When you're, when you're, uh, the the point is this: we don't let anything drag us down. Don't let anything drag you down. Any 
little progress, any little hope, allow that to put air under your wings. Be patient. You're going you're gonna to trust God for the results. And then, let's look at the New Testament. And let's look at patience. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 in the New Testament. Are you okay? We're almost finished. Luke chapter 8. And I, I realize that, you know, no one here really needs patience, but I just thought it would be good for us to cover it anyway. Just so you could help somebody else in case they might need it. Luke 8. You know this is the parable of the sower that Jesus gave. Notice verse 15. This is the, the seed, but that, on the, that, that fell on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Patience. This is Jesus explaining the parable of the sower and the different types of soil, soil that the seed fell into. This is the only soil that produced a harvest. The good soil. Sometimes I pray that Lord make our hearts good soil. The Word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit. It comes from this parable that Jesus gave. But it, notice it brings forth fruit with patience. We all know that you don't, you don't plant the harvest today and expect to reap it tomorrow. You have to, it takes patience. You have to wait. And you know, you don't get saved today and become a mature, fruit-bearing Christian tomorrow. It takes some patience. It takes some time. We tell those men in the prison, has God, the, the whole program of RU is that God has to change the way you think. And if God can change, if you'll let God change the way you think, you'll change the way you live. And that's a process. That's not going to be anything instant. You're not just going to come for two weeks and say, okay, I got it. And uh, I'm, 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 all, I'm all fine now. It's a process of, of continuing to, to get to where you'll, 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 you'll not be thinking about what I want, what I feel, what I think, but you'll think what God wants, what God feels, what God thinks. And all of us face those decisions every single day. Will I respond to this situation the way I want or will I respond the way God wants? Which, which am I going to go? Which way, wh what am I thinking? So, it's interesting. And by the way, if you're putting in your, your blank there, D is keeping a good attitude. Keeping good attitude. Because the word for patience here means, literally, it's a compound word. The first word means cheerful filled with hope. And the second part of the word means to endure without ever quitting. So patience is more than just our actions. Patience is in our attitude as well. You know, you can be patient in your actions but not be patient with your attitude. Okay? You ever... You ever had somebody help you, but they had a bad attitude? You almost would just as soon not have their help. In fact, you, you probably decided it's not worth having the help if you're going to have that kind of an attitude. I'll do it myself. Move on. <laughs> it can happen to people. It can happen to us when we're trying to help those in the snare of Satan. Our attitude can overcome our intention. Our lack of cheerful waiting can keep us from being able to rescue them. So God says you have to, have, you have to be patient. You have to, you have to keep on leaping for joy. You have to keep on jumping up and down. You have to keep on doing what you know to do. You have to hold it together. You have to stay aloft with those with just a little bit of air, just a little bit of hope. 
You can't lose your cool. You have to enjoy what you're doing. You have to have cheerfulness without ever giving up. That's, the, that's, that's what God means when He said patience. Patience. Most of us in America are clock people. We live by the clock. And what that means is we want to see results right now. I want to see something happening. I mean, I want, I want people to, come on, you know, like, like that video we showed a while back with Bob Newhart in it. Remember with the therapist, you know? I'm going to give you two words. You know, write these down if you will. This lady with a fear of being buried alive in a, in a wooden box, I think it was. He says, okay, now you, you, she says, well, I'll get a pencil and write them down. He says, you, you, you won't need to write these down. You'll, you'll remember them. He says, okay, what, what are they? And he said, stop it. Just stop it. That's kind of how most of us are. Somebody's caught in the snare of Satan. They're doing something wrong. We just want to say, come on, what's wrong with you? Stop it. And the problem is, if they could have stopped it, they would have. They're caught in the snare. And, and the more you struggle and the more you try when you're in a snare, it only gets worse. It only gets worse. I want people to break those bonds and escape the snares and be home in time for dinner. But it doesn't always work that way. Somebody says, we can't be clock people. We have to be calendar people. We have to understand it's going to take a while. It doesn't happen overnight. Rescuing those who've been ensnared by Satan takes time. You can't take somebody who's, who's had 20 or 30 years of their life thinking the wrong way and think in, in a few months' time they're going to be completely changed. It's not going to happen. It's going to take time to change the way they think. And so we have to be patient. If we're patient, if we're apt to teach, if we don't strive, if we're gentle, if we're apt to teach, and we're patient, we have a great opportunity to recover some who've been snared by Satan. Now, the perfect example of the one who's patient is God. Just by way of illustration, won't turn to that, but when they came out of Egypt, they're in Exodus 32, and God calls Moses and Elijah up to the mountain to give them the law of God. And as they're coming down from the mountain, remember, they heard the noise in the camp. And they go down there, and the music is playing, and everybody's dancing around without any clothes on, and, and they're just, it's, it's wickedness and immorality going on. Remember what God wanted to do? Wipe them out. Moses intercedes. And ask God, please don't do it. Don't destroy him. Moses, I think, weeps for the children of Israel. You see, they had come out of Egypt, but Egypt hadn't come out of them. God was angry and He was going to kill them and, and Moses interceded and beseeched God to be merciful and God was merciful. You know why? It's in the nature of God to be patient. It's in His nature to be patient. Exodus 34 and verse 6 says that the Lord passed by before Him and proclaimed, The Lord thy Lord, God, is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Do you understand without God's patience, most of us would not be in the room tonight. God is patient with us. And having received that patience, having been recipients of His mercy, I want to be merciful to others. I want to be patient with others. That's what it takes to help people to repent and recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now next week, we're going to talk about the next part in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. What is that talking about? 
I guess we'll have to come Wednesday night and find that out, okay? So uh, let's plan to be back next Wednesday evening. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to study your word together. Lord, we do want to be servants of the Lord. We do want to not strive, not be argumentative. We want to be gentle. We want to be soft in our manners, in our words. Lord, we want to be apt to teach the Word of God to others with patience. Lord, I pray You'd help us by Thy Spirit to recover those who have been taken captive by Satan. That they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Lord, we want to be those kind of Christians. Recovering the broken vessels, the vessels of dishonor, that they could become vessels of honor once again for you. And Lord, I, I'm praying for you to save the lost this coming Lord's Day, that folks will come in and they'll hear the gospel. They'll hear that Jesus Christ came to die for their sins and that they can put their faith and trust in Him and receive the gift of eternal life. But Lord, I'm asking you to bring in some broken vessels Sunday that we could minister to, that we could let them know we care, and we could see some believers recovered out of the snare of Satan. Some vessels that have been vessels of dishonor that after Sunday will become and start down the road of becoming a vessel unto honor once again for you. Allow it to be that kind of a day, Father. Bless our church family. Keep us healthy. Keep us strong. Help us be prepared for what you'll do on the Lord's Day. Bless the efforts these next few days and the remaining flyers that go out, the invitations that are given, the preparations, the work that will be done on Saturday. May your hand be upon it, Lord. We'll give you the praise and you the glory for all you do. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.